वेलकम टू ई पी जी पाठशाला आई एम डॉक्टर अनिता भेला फ्रॉम द यूनिवर्सिटी ऑफ डेली एंड टुडे वी विल बी डूइंग द सेकेंड मॉड्यूल ऑन एरिस्टोटल्स पोइटिक्स दिस हैज बीन प्रिपेयर बाय प्रोफेसर ओमना एंटनी फ्रॉम द के आर मंगलम यूनिवर्सिटी गुड़गांव वी हैव ऑलरेडी डन समथिंग अबाउट एरिस्टोटल्स लाइफ एंड हेज वर्कस but we will go over them briefly once again he was born in 384 bce and died in 322 bce his father was the personal physician of the king of macedon and he they had access to the royal palace aristotle was educated at plato's academy that is he was a student of plato but later on he established his own academy at lyceum where he taught students he was also invited to be the teacher mentor of alexander the great much of his writings were written while he was at his academy in athens and as we have told earl told you earlier aristotle was an extremely learned man who was extremely passionate about learning in fact there was no subject which he had not studied he studied astronomy physics theology philosophy of course literature and poetics the one important thing about aristotle is that he went against his mentor that is plato in his ideas of poetry plato had banished all poets from his ideal state but aristotle reestablished the use and value of poetry he tells us that poetry is important it can contribute to life but that only under certain conditions he gives us the idea of mimesis that is imitation and he classifies different types of poetry according to the nature mode and object of imitation he tells us that a poet may imitate something that he observes as it is as he thinks it is or as he thinks it ought to be and based on this it will depend on the type of work that the poet produces poetics is a central document which has been of great influence over subsequent centuries after aristotle it was discovered in translation during the renaissance first in florence italy and then later the ideas came to other nations and especially it had a great influence in england we don't know whether shakespeare had read aristotle or not but he did have in his works many ideas on which which aristotle has talked about although he did not stick to the unities aristotle's poetics have been the one book with which later critics have either agreed or disagreed but they have always based their agreements or disagreements on aristotle's principles as we said he talks about the idea of mimesis or imitation imitation he tells us is something which is instinctual in us we all like to imitate right from our ch- this thing begins right from childhood Aristotle classifies poetry into different kinds 
based on the nature of imitation. If the imitation concerns a noble character and a noble action, then we call it epic or tragedy. But if it is an imitation of lower actions and of lower qualities, then we call it satire or comedy. Epic poetry and tragedy have a number of similarities and because of which epic poetry is also termed tragedy. Both the yawns imitate noble men in action. Both maintain a unity of plot, that is they have a beginning, a middle and an end and the plot is based on cause and effect. The object of mimesis is also the same subject matter. Both of them can be either simple or complex and they can deal either with character or with suffering. And all the six components are common to both including the idea of peripegia and anagnorisis. Peripegia, of course, and agnorisis is something which we will discuss a little later. Both tragedy and epic are meant to be imitations of great deeds, noble deeds, noble actions, noble heroes and should depict tragic suffering. All the elements of the epic poem are present in tragedy, but all the elements of tragedy are not present in the epic poem. Although the object of imitation in both is the same, yet there are many differences. Now we will deal a little in detail about the origins of tragedy and what Aristotle has to say about tragedy. Tragedy has its origin in the dithyrambic hymns sung by a large choir praising the god Dionysus. These were passionate speeches and later on the Greek playwright Aeschylus added another actor and reduced the role of the choir and also a little bit of the music. But, the, but Aristotle felt that Aeschylus had not developed a poetic language for tragedy. In Aristotle's view, the greatest tragic poet was Sophocles. Sophocles not only added a third character, but he had unity of plot and his characters were noble characters. Aristotle compares him to Homer in his approach to humanity. As I said, Sophocles modified the existing concept of tragedy by introducing a third character and slowly more characters and different kinds of speeches were added so that tragedy developed into its present form. According to Aristotle, tragedy is an imitation. The imitation of an action that is serious and also as having magnitude, complete in itself, in appropriate and pleasurable language, in a dramatic rather than narrative form, with incidents arousing pity and fear wherewith to accomplish a catharsis of these emotions. This is in Aristotle's own words. According to Aristotle, tragedy is the most refined version of poetry as it deals with the imitation of lofty matters and 
it is the ultimate form of our inner delight in imitation. As we know it, it is the medium of tragedy is the dramatic form and therefore we know that tragedy is not to tell but to show or to perform. And Aristotle finds it more philosophical than history. He tells us how tragedy differs from history. We know that later Sydney will be comparing not tragedy and history but history and poetry and telling us how poetry is superior to history. Here Aristotle is telling us how tragedy is superior to history. Whereas history we are only told about the events. This happened, that happened, it happened in this year, etc, etc. But in tragedy we see the action actually taking place right in front of our eyes. Again, history only tells us what had happened. But in tragedy we are actually seeing what is going to happen. History may be seen in isolation, it may not have you know, cause and effect, but the actions performed in a tragedy always have cause and effect. Tragedy is rooted in the fundamentals of how human life works. It works with human emotions that are universal, whereas history has little relevance to others and deals with things that are very specific. So while history is specific, tragedy is universal in nature. Now, what are the various characteristics that a tragedy should have according to Aristotle? One, of course, we have already studied, that is, it is my Mac. It is, it is based on mimesis, it is serious. It tells a story which is of the right length. Why of the appropriate length? As we discussed earlier, an epic may be of any length because and it, and it does not need one sitting, only one sitting to listen to it or to know about it. But tragedy is to be performed, so it should depend, the length should depend on how long the audience can sit at one place and watch it. A tragedy must have rhythm and harmony, and this rhythm and harmony is to be seen in all aspects. It is to be performed rather than narrated and most important of all, at the end it should arouse feelings of pity and fear and purge these feelings and this arousing of the feelings of pity and fear and the subsequent purgation that takes place Aristotle calls catharsis. We may relate this idea of catharsis to Bharat's Natya Shastra and his concept of rasa. He also includes pity and fear as the amongst the nine emotions that he talks about. He talks about comedy that is hasya, he talks about karuna that is pity, he talks about heroic that is veer, he talks about Radra, that is anger, he also talks about Vibhats and he also talks about the Adbhut and he calls these the permanent emotions that are permanently within the human heart and which can be roused through proper portrayal. 
according to aristotle tragedy is the most refined version of poetry as it deals with the imitation of lofty things it always imitates the actions of noble men and as we have done it constitutes six components they are plot character thought diction song and spectacle according to aristotle plot is the soul of tragedy what does he mean by plot that is the action of the in the plot is of the greatest significance he says there can be tragedy without character or music but there cannot be any tragedy without plot plot according to aristotle is the arrangement of the incidents when the incidents are arranged in the correct sequence with effective links that is when the tragedy has its true effect another important thing that aristotle has to say about tragedy is that it must have universal significance it must not be too specific everyone should be able to identify with it it should compromise comprise a definite structure and there should be an unity of theme and purpose then he gives us a list of the specifications of a successful plot of a tragedy as we had quoted aristotle earlier it should have completeness it should have magnitude it should have unity it should have a determinate structure and it should have universality what do we mean when we say that it must have completeness that is it must be a complete whole it must have a beginning a middle and an end and the beginning must be such that it should give rise to the cause and effect chain based on something that is within the plot the middle should also be caused by the earlier incidents and the incidents that follow should also be have some reason the end or resolution must be the result of the preceding events and there should be a solution or is the or the problem that has been presented should be resolved that has been created during the previous incidents the right kind of sequencing of events will give a feeling of completeness and a sense of completeness to the tragedy the magnitude of the plot refers to the length of the plot the length of the play should be such that the viewers can sort of take it in their stride that is they can take it in their memory and because of this it should not be too complex because if there are too many incidents then the audience can get confused and this is one of the charges that is leveled against shakespeare some of shakespeare's plays that there are too many incidents in some of his plays which mar the tragedy even if there are incidents in the plot then they should revolve around one theme it should not be that there are as we said there should not be too many incidents which are of which have no relation to each other if there are incidents then they should revolve around one particular theme of course the more the number of incidents related to that one theme the richer the tragedy will be if the plot is very brief with very few incidents then it will not be of artistic value so the plot should be complex and compact 
and comprehensive but should revolve around only one theme. What is unity? The unity of action. The whole action and incidents must be revolving around the central action with an organic unity. The best plots combine peripegia and agnorosis as part of their cause and effect chain and in turn create the catastrophe leading to the final scene of suffering. What is peripegia? Peripegia is the reversal of fortune. It, it means that a person for a good person may fall because of a certain flaw and so there is a reversal of fortune that takes place. Whereas an agnorosis means recognition and leading to the self, it could end in self-recognition or it could end in the change that takes place. The various events and incidents in the plot should be linked with the remarkable coherence. It is the expertise of the poet to prune or avoid all the irrational and irrelevant details from the plot. There should be a perfect sequencing of the events or incidents happening in the play. The whole body of the play should be able to stand as a unit. What do we mean that the tragedy should have universality? It means that whatever is shown in tragedy should be as close to real life as possible and should be within the realm of probability. The way the action is shown should remind us or recall to our mind as to how a human being would have acted in the same way as the hero of the tragedy has acted. The theme and the associated actions should also be, of a, should also be universal in nature and of sufficient significant value so that they catch the attention of the audience. Next to plot in tragedy is the importance of the character. It is the imitation of action or thought or emotions that is tragedy. And these aspects should belong to the object of imitation that is the tragic heroes. The tragic heroes actions themselves must bring about the reversal, the recognition and catharsis that is the peripegia and the anagnorisis and the catharsis. Aristotle explains four qualities for the character. What are the qualities of a tragic hero? The tragic hero should be good, should be renowned and should be prosperous. He should be a courageous person who is dear to everyone. He should not be so exaggerated that we cannot believe in him. He should be true to life and anyone in the audience should be able to identify himself or herself with him. And the emotions undergone by the hero should be as close to real life and real situations as well. If in a play we have a person behaving in one way in one scene and in another way in another scene, then we cannot believe in that character. So there should always be consistency in character presentation. Whenever the character player appears in the play, he should appear to be consistent in his manner of behavior and in his speech. Whatever the adversities that the tragic hero is facing or experiencing due to a, rever due to a reversal of his fortune must be due to some weakness of law in his character. 
that is the tragic hero must be a good man, a prosperous man, one who is loved by all, yet he should possess a tragic flaw because of which the reversal of fortune or the peripegia takes place. It could be an error in judgment resulting from the flaw or weakness in the character of the hero that reverses his fortune to a pitiful status, arousing the feeling of pity in the play. The tragic flaw of the character Aristotle calls Hermersia. We have many examples from Shakespeare of the tragic flaw. Macbeth is the supreme example. A nobleman, loved by all, respected by all. What is his tragic flaw? Ambition. This desire for kingship brings about his peripegia, that is his reversal of fortune. And his hamersia is his ambition. We also have Othello. Othello too is a great and noble character. Yet his feelings of jealousy are the cause of his downfall. So we see Aristotle's ideas of tragedy actually in the plays of Shakespeare. Although we do not know whether Shakespeare had read Aristotle or not. The third important component of a tragic play is thought. Thought is important because actions spring out from thoughts. A tragedy is the imitation of act in action or imitation of men in action. Everything that is supposed to be brought out through the effect of speech or action is included under thought. The verbal and the non-verbal images also refer, are also a part of that. The cathartic effect of arousing the feelings of pity and fear is ultimately the result of proper thought. Next we come to diction. Diction takes the fourth place among the components that constitute a tragedy. What is diction? Diction is the metrical arrangement of words in the play. As we discussed earlier, that whereas the epic has only one meter, that is hexameter, in tragedy we may have different types of meter to suit the different types of characters, but generally written in the iambic. Diction also includes the verbal expression of the content or the subject matter of the tragic play. The nature, type, quality and aptness of vocabulary used in the tragedy should be proper and appropriate to the character, plot and objective of the tragedy. That is the language, the poetic language should match the character. Of course, embellishments, he says, are welcome, but they should be used appropriately. Whether the diction is rich, intellectual or decorative, the objective is achieved through the manner that text or script is delivered by the character. The character must have a deep awareness about the tone of the content. The character must be able to discriminate between a command, a request, advice, threat, query and a prayer. When the poet writes a script in which the character is intended to command the goddess and the character delivers the script as a prayer, the whole intended purpose of the situation is damaged. Song. 
Aristotle calls the music elements of the chorus as song or melody. Song is splendid aspect of tragic play because it makes sense to everybody and the viewer appreciates the artistic form with sheer pleasure. The chorus creates and keeps the melody of the play and Aristotle strongly insists that the chorus should be an integral part of the play as an actor or action is to the play. Song takes a, con a serious role in contributing to the unity of the plot. That is when the chorus is a part or integral part then it will contribute to the unity. If it stands apart it may not. Spectacle. Spectacle is the last component of a tragic play according to Aristotle and he thinks that it is of the lowest importance because it has very little to do with literature. The poet who is writing a tragedy has to give his primary attention to the inner structure of the work, to the plot which is the soul of tragedy. And he will put in all his efforts to the unity of the work so that it achieves an artistic value. Usually no creator does the creation thinking about the spectacle. The beauty of spectacle arises when the play is brought out with the artistic value. So it is an automatic byproduct of a good play. The artist may not focus on spectacle to achieve the artistic beauty of the play. It, it, it becomes an automatic byproduct, according to Aristotle. Now let us come to an analysis of the aesthetic pleasure of tragedy. As we discussed earlier, Aristotle talks about hemertia or the tragic flaw which brings about the reversal of the fortune of the hero. And then comes the recognition of the hidden truth leading to catharsis. And these is the, this sequence is the integral part of a successful tragedy. If a good man comes to a bad end, we do not experience tragedy. If a bad man comes to a bad end, then also we do not experience tragedy. But if a good man comes to a bad end because of some tragic flaw, that is when we actually experience the emotions of pity and fear. If a tragic fall is due to the character's own folly and which leads to horrible sufferings, that is when we experience catharsis. Catharsis is a medical metaphor used by Aristotle with the meaning purging. Very often the viewers who watch the fall of the tragic hero very often identify themselves with the tragic hero. This empathy makes the viewers give an outlet to their suppressed emotions like fear, anger and feel relieved mentally by the purgation of these feelings. They get pleasure not out of a feeling that they enjoy somebody's fall but because of the closeness to life and when they experience catharsis they imagine that they could also be in this situation. So we may conclude by saying that Aristotle places tragedy over and above epic. He thinks that it is the greatest form of poetry. He believes that the true value of an art in its power to give aesthetic pleasure and tragedy excels in it through its cathartic effect. A successful tragedy enables human beings to become better persons. Thus tragedy stands unique because of its 
quality and its objectives. Thank you. Refer to the e-text for further details.